we are extremely happy that the Professor Andrew Vitti, Emeritus Professor of Delhi University and Chancellor of Nihu and Osuka University is here with us in this university. Uh, we take the advantage of to have a discussion with him and along with us, uh, Professor Taburam Tai, former Professor of English, Patan College also with us. So we want to just discuss something regarding this growing intolerance in the society. There may be various reasons, maybe there may be some religious intolerance, there may be other social intolerance. So we just have some idea about from Professor Andrew the uh, nationally, he is the, uh, the only nationally renowned personality in the sociology. Uh, I just uh, want to have your view, sir, uh, regarding this basic problem. Well, uh, I think that there is a lot of intolerance, there is a lot of disorder, there is a lot of violence, but I think it would be a mistake to think that this was all absent in the past and it has suddenly grown up today. Yes. It has grown over a period of time. And if we take a proper historical perspective, then we will not feel uh, that everything is falling apart. I don't think everything is falling apart in India. Religious intolerance, I have experienced it myself as a boy in Calcutta. I went through the great Calcutta killings of 1946. Ah, yes. What better example can you have of religious intolerance? So this is there. I don't think that we should brush it under the carpet. It's there. But I don't think that we should exaggerate its impact. Actually, at the same time, uh, in Assam also we have seen intolerances. There are a lot of places between the tribals and non-tribals. A uh, lot of people between this, uh, the, of course, some terrorist organizations are, are also involved in these activities. Since Professor Taburam Pai, he is a very well-known personality in the state. I think, uh, I can, can I request you, sir, to have, throw some light on this type of intolerances, uh, caste problems in this state. Uh, Professor Vitei, you have already referred to the phenomenon of growing intolerance in the country. And so I did not repeat the we, uh, India, so it's a land of great diversity. We as a nation are divided by races, religions, languages, cultures, castes, classes, and what have you. And any of these elements of diversity has the potential of returning volcanic and erupting somewhere at some time in India. So in such a situation probably we need to grow more tolerant, more we should learn to be, learn to live together. But instead of doing so, probably we have been growing more and more intolerant. So, uh, someone writes a book expressing his or her opinions about his beliefs, about a certain religion. You don't like the ideas spread there. So attack him and destroy his work. Someone creates a piece of art, a piece of painting, uh, from the uh, showing his imagination, fantasy, etc. You don't like the idea there, so attack him and destroy his work. Uh, we, we remember that lawyer, a couple of years ago probably, expressing an opinion about his I belief about the status of Kashmir. We don't like his idea and go and kick him. So and recently, recently, say probably, last March or so, a group of Kashmiri students, they support the Pakistani team when the Pakistani team wins the Asia Cup uh, cricket competition. They, are in a, they were in a college. They are suspended for three days from the college because, because they supported the Pakistani team. What's happening actually, what's happening is this kind of growing intolerance and there are, you know, there's so many instances. Yes, I, I, I do not wish to uh, underrate the presence of intolerance in this country. There is a lot of intolerance in this country, and from time to time it erupts into violence. But 
I don't think that we should have a rose-tinted view of what prevailed in the past. There were divisions in the past, divisions on the basis of language, divisions on the basis of religion, and uh, these, these uh, led to a fair amount of violence and a fair amount of disorder even in the past. What has happened now is that it is much easier for intolerant groups to organize themselves politically. So you have the social roots of disharmony, discord, intolerance, but it is now becoming easier to organize all this politically. That's the downside of it. The upside of it is that along with this, there is a growing Indian middle class which is interested in individual effort, individual initiative, and in creating a better economy. We must keep these two things together in our mind and not focus only on one. There are those who welcome the rise of the new middle class, the new technology, the new occupational structure, and lose sight of the negative side. As a sociologist, I feel that we must take into account both the negative and the positive side and do not exaggerate one at the expense of the other. This is my view of it. And I think that we should worry about disorder, we should worry about intolerance, we should worry about violence, but we should not get into a panic and say, this is happening now, what will happen next? Because this is what people have been saying in India. I remember, I was a boy in 1946 in capital. People said, this is the end. But it wasn't. There have been other riots in the Muslim riots in, in Calcutta, elsewhere in West Bengal, in the 70s and the 80s. But again, we should, I, I, I always say, we should neither be complacent about it, nor put ourselves into a state of panic. So another, another, another idea that's also a bit uh, from you, that is, is it also a reason for uh, intolerance because of the growing inequality in the society? That might be one of the reasons. That and also be. some jealousness. Well, that, the... could be, could, that could be. But you take for granted that inequalities are growing. Yes. What is the evidence for that? We talked about Suresh Tendulkar. Suresh Tendulkar devoted a lifetime to the study of economic inequality. And his argument was that there is no evidence that economic inequality is growing. In fact, if anything, economic inequality is as strong or as weak as it was in the past. I don't think that it's very easy to prove that economic inequality is growing. So what happens is you have a problem, and then you look to one side of the picture. And you, inequality grows particularly in a country in which the economy is growing, it's developing. A new middle class is growing. New middle class likes to move upwards, leaving other people behind. And if you are to have a new middle class, you must be prepared for having a class which wants to move upwards without caring very much for those whom they leave behind. This happened in the West, this happened in England, this happened in America. So there is an upside and a downside. I think one of the things which I think is on the whole a positive development in our society is the slow but steady change in the position of women in this society. Yes. I think that's a very positive sign. That I think is very, very important and we mustn't lose sight of that fact. And I think women will play an increasingly important role in our society, in public life and not just in private life. And I think that on the whole, they will have a beneficial effect in our society. Now you see women are in, in, in higher education. They are very well represented in employment, in professional employment, in medicine, law, entertainment, banking. And this is something new in Indian society. Uh, look at the number of bankers who are women. Yes. Look at the number of doctors, people in the um, uh, in the mass media who are women. All of this is new. You can't expect a large and complex society like ours to change itself without any pains. Yeah. Without any so, pains. so again, so we uh, we see also in the colleges and universities now the present day students they become uh, more intolerant compared to about 20, 30 years. So is it because of the growing unemployment uncertainty of their future? No, uh, first of all, I question your statement as a statement of fact that they are growing more intolerant than yeah. they were before. I don't think that there is evidence to show mm -hmm. that they are more intolerant than before. Why should we assume, yes, there is inequality, and perhaps inequality is increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as I said, I mean, Suresh, I used to discuss this with Suresh Tendulkar, and there is a man called 
ke sundaram work together and their view is that there is very little evidence to show that economic inequality inequality in the distribution of income has grown in the last 50 years or even in the last 30 years and certainly i think there is evidence to show that what is more important than economic inequality poverty has not grown either absolutely or relatively mm -hmm. i don't think it has grown and side by side but we see that the middle class is rising the middle class is vicious the middle class does want to be restrained in its urge for upward mobility and so we tend to think then that this must be at the cost of someone. We think of these things in terms of a zero-sum game. If the middle class is expanding, this must be at the expense of the poor. This is not necessarily the case. No, no, can, I, can I, Professor, come to a very specific uh, issue? Close uh, at home, uh, which is the problem of the young world in India. Uh, we say, uh, may I recount a, a story of a major friend of mine at the University of Delhi in 1964-66, when you were already teaching there. Uh, this Mizo friend of mine complained almost every day that some Delhi youngsters quoted from behind him and said, Chini, Hindi, bye bye. So, obviously echoing, you know, that Zawarilai's visit to India and the kind of the slogan that Made currency at the time. Because the racial background. Yeah, yeah. Because the, I, I, re, I refer to that racial this, the diversity. So that that's question of racial diversity. But that was, you see, at the individual of some youngsters, not much harm done, done but although my middle friend felt very bad about it. So am I not an Indian? So that was his question. So why should he, why should they consider me? A Chinese, which is easy, by the way. Now, recently, say this Orunachari's young man is killed. A Manipuri youth is also killed. And uh, there is this, there was this news about the Gujarat hotel where uh, the Chinese president was staying recently. Where the Manipuri youths working in the hotel, they were segregated. Now, uh, this, I mean, Northeasterners have it, and there are stories of women being harassed and... No, that is all very true. Say, That's all very true. What, but what's wrong? What, how do you, how we do you look at the situation? We must put it in a proper perspective. I've been asked by many people, Andre Bede, what kind of a name is it? <laughs> are you an Indian? Are you Hindustani? Yeah. No, one must take it in the proper perspective. One mustn't think that this is an example of growing intolerance. They hate me because they hate someone who doesn't have a name like Amit Bhaduri or Sumit Sahib. Yeah. I don't think that, you know, we must have a proper sense of proportion in these matters. Of course, um, people are puzzled, but in India, I would say that in India, we are used to living with a diversity of religion, a diversity of languages, a diversity of communities to a much greater extent than in most other parts of the world. But if we are to think that we can continue with this great diversity of languages, religions, castes, communities without any pain, yes. then it's a mistake. So I, uh, I would like to ask you both of you. Uh, so what we see in Gohati recently, suppose uh, there is some accident of a car immediately car is burned down. So there is something something happening in a house. So illegal activity happening in the house, the house is, hard, hard, the house is burned down. The owner is beaten up. So this intolerance... This is bad. Yeah. This is very bad. But yeah. it happened in the past also. You've uh, forgotten about it. Yeah. I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> it happened in the past also. In the, one of the things that worries me, and it is true, is that perhaps there is growing violence against women. But you must take it in the proper perspective. There is growing violence against women, particularly because women are doing so well in life. They're coming out, they're going to the universities, they're going to work, they're joining the profession, and many men don't like it. So yeah. what are we going to do? Put the women back into Parga, keep them at home, or take the risk? That's what certain religious groups are basically dictating, right? Yeah, no These should be the proper guidelines that the women should follow. 
So uh, it again becomes a matter of intolerance towards it women. It is intolerance, but we should cope with this yes. intolerance. So, uh, no religious group has a right to declare yes. uh, where, how much freedom women should enjoy. But there are people yes. who use religion yes. for putting forward these views, which are unacceptable in terms of political order. Mm -hmm. Look, we are, the, the basic problem is the following. We have adopted a democratic political order, we have, and we have to deal with it. And we have not done all that badly. So we want a democratic political order. The basic premise of democracy is equality. But we have inherited the most hierarchical society in the world. Yes. So how do you harmonize? How do you move forward with a society which is hierarchical and a political order which wants to be democratic? Thank this you. is one of the basic roots of the tension that we find in Indian society. And it's not going to go away. There's no magic solution to this. But I don't think that we should turn our backs on it and yes. pretend that it was wonderful where was there violence against women 50 years ago on the streets? There wasn't. Where, were, where was the youth teasing 50 years ago? There wasn't. Because women stayed at home. They didn't, they didn't go to college. They didn't go to employment. So they have to face it. I'm not, I'm not justifying violence against women or youth teasing. But they have to face it. They have to face it and they have to cope with it. And we cannot put them back. So the mentality has not changed. It, it is changing. Yeah, no, it is changing, but it has not changed fast enough. Yes. Or it has not changed sufficiently. It is changing. I do believe that it is changing. But it has not changed fast enough. The mentality among students in universities and colleges has changed radically. People do notice this. Calcutta University, when I was a student in Calcutta University in the 1950s, in the postgraduate department, Ashutosh College, uh, Ashutosh Building. I had some friends in the English department, so I would go and visit it. You know what the procedure was? The procedure was that the women would stand outside. The boys would go and occupy the bank benches. The women would enter the class along with the professor. And they, the, the first two rows were reserved, but they would enter along with the professor. Uh, and today this is unthinkable. So they felt insecure. No, no, so today, so you think, is it better today or was it better before? Better, 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 better. So, but this does, has not come without any price for women. It has, it has, there has been a price that women have, have had to pay. So, but you must count the costs, but you must also count the benefits. That is the problem. When we look back on the past, we look back only on the benefits. When we look at the present, we look only at the costs. Problem will continue. This problem will continue. Of course. How can you have the a democratic? Change. How can you have a democratic social order without any problems? How how can you? Where do you have it in the world? Now, Professor, what is your rating of casteism in India today? Is it waning? So that's a very difficult question to answer because I will say yes and no. It is waning, but it's, in some respects, in some respects, the rigors of caste are declining. Let me give you three examples. The caste system, particularly the Hindu caste system, was based on the ritual opposition of purity and pollution, interdine, taking water from this person, taking kacha food from that person. That is certainly declining. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. in, also in rural everywhere it is declining. It is not declining at the same rate. I'm not saying that everywhere it has disappeared. It has not disappeared. It's, it is still there, but it is declining. If you look at the trend, it is declining from both rural and urban areas, but it's not declining at the same rate everywhere. It is not declining at the same rate in all regions, in all parts of the country. Then, so the rigors of purity and putting up. Women were not allowed to enter the kitchen when they were in their periods. How can you keep women away from the office when they're in the periods? You know, these, these things we tend to forget. Uh, women now work and sit with men. Can you imagine in, in, in a community, in a village, or anywhere, the woman giving orders to a man of a superior caste who has to take those orders. This happens when the woman is an IAS officer yeah. and she has a stenographer who is a brandy. Mm -hmm. The woman may be uh, a kolita or a caste or whatever. Is she has to, uh, he has to take orders from her. So this is also... The system has changed. And I think the status of the woman as an IAS officer, that becomes dominant rather than her caste Except status. that her, her caste and her gender status does yes. not disappear. It yes. does that, not disappear. That still remains. That That's remains, unique. but it is superseded yes. by her status, by her occupation. Uh, yes. But in the South India, sir, as I understand, 
that this uh, there's a lot of caste uh, this segregation is there. So, well, for example, the sometimes suppose the Sindhu caste people are there in the other line of these uh, roads. The Brahmins are not uh, allowing them to look to the side, or Brahmins are not no, to the other side. So this is uh, still continuing. No, that, that, no, no. The boot is on the other foot. Mm -hmm. It's the Brahmins who are at the receiving end. No, mm -hmm. that's that's that. And again, this is the backward classes movement has played a very important part mm -hmm. in transforming the social order in Tamil Nadu. So it's, it's no longer what it was in the past. This idea that the I've seen this. I'll give you a dramatic example of a change which I saw in 1962, and it has proceeded. In 1962, I lived in a very orthodox Brahmin village in the Tangdor district, and I lived on the Brahmin street, Agraha. And before I had settled into the place, in the evenings, I would hear somebody shouting from the back lane, Swami, Swami, Swami is what? The lower class call any brand. And yeah. then he became curious. What is happening? So my friend, the Brahmin, <laughs> explained to me, he said, you know, he's come to deliver the grain to the house of his Brahmin land. He can't enter the street. He has to shout from outside so that somebody goes out and opens the door and then he will put it there and go away. He's not about to go. Yes, yes. But I remembered that when the school, which was located at the head of the Agraha, the Brahmin Street, when the school was over, all the children ran through the Agraha. Yes. And some of them were Harijan children. Mm -hmm. Together, they go together. Well, they, they, I don't know whether they go together, but they, they're all there. Yes. No, please don't exaggerate. I'm not saying that all differences have disappeared. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that all Brahmin and Harijan boys go hand in hand. So this, this segregation of the Harijans in their waters, which is the question you ask, has declined substantially. And again, let me tell you a story which will give you a good idea of how this has happened. When I lived in that village, I lived on the Brandon Street. And that village has a tradition of something like classical music. And there were three children. Whom I used to know, they were all Brahmin children, and one of them was called Kausalya. She was then 12 or 13 years old. Kausalya never married, but afterwards she learned classical music. She got a degree in music from Tanjore University, and after retirement, she stays in the same village, in the same house with her mother. So I asked her younger sister, who is then four or five years old, who is now a lady of, in her 50s, I said, What is Kausalya? She said, no, she is very much interested in music. Mm -hmm. So she teaches music in the home. I said, in the home, yes. And I said, who are her pupils? She said, no, when the children come, she, she doesn't charge any money, but she teaches. And I said, uh, but what kind of children are they to come? Do the Harijan children come? She laughed. She said, only the Harijan children come. The <laughs> other children have no time for classical music. They are learning computers. Uh -huh. so is this not a change? So thank you very much uh, so for being with us and a very fruitful discussion regarding this uh, interval, growing intervals. If you don't mind, I have a, a final yes. question from my side because uh, So we have our diversity and uh, we have a democratic quality to bolster the causes of this diversity. And uh, I'm wondering whether we have a you, you think that we have a strong mechanism to manage our diversity? We have a mechanism. It's not a strong mechanism. I want to ask you, in which country do they have a strong mechanism which always works without any <laughs> failing? Our education. No, I, everything is in need of I think law and order is in need of The law and order situation is not, uh, is not very satisfactory. This does not mean that there is total anarchy. Yeah, and in the past, the law and order situation was wonderful. It was not so. Yeah. So anyway, thank you very much, sir, thank you. Uh, for being with us. Or also thank you. Thank Professor Tai uh, for being with us in this morning. Okay. Thank you.